What's going on, Warriors? It's Coach Jay. Today, we're going to dive in. We're going to talk about everything you need to know about taking creatine monohydrate as a type 1 diabetic. Even if you're not a type 1 diabetic, you're going to get a lot out of this video on creatine. We're going to talk about what it is, how to take it, best practices for taking it so you can maximize muscle growth. Also, how this is different for type 1 diabetics, which is key to understanding our bodies to take things to the next level when it comes to muscle development and why this is something you should or should not take. We're also going to go at the end of the video, I'm going to drop some of the most important misconceptions about creatine as well that could be getting in the way or could lead you down the wrong path even with your doctors. So we want to avoid this specifically as well as type 1 diabetics, so make sure you stick around. If it's your first time on the channel, I'm a type 1 diabetic for over 26 years and I'm a diabetic fitness coach who helps diabetics to build muscle, to burn body fat and control their blood sugars overall. But if you're not a diabetic and you just like things like supplement reviews, or you like to hear me rant, or just run around in circles with my cats, then make sure you guys smash the subscribe button down below, hit that bell notification so you guys don't miss out on any of these videos. Without further ado, let's just jump right in. Oh, bitch, you didn't know your boy had talent like that. Woo, let's go. Creatine is a natural substance that our body makes, and it's made by combining amino acids like glycine, arginine, and methionine, and it's made through the kidneys and the liver. Your body can make about one to two grams of creatine per day, and we can also get creatine through sources like our diet. Through eating more meat-based options can increase creatine as well. Now, if you're somebody that's on a vegan diet, you're not gonna get that extra bout of creatine that you would get if you were eating meat. And this is gonna be important. We'll circle back to this in a bit. And creatine is the most studied supplement on the market. And I would say it is the number one supplement that I have taken being a bodybuilder for over 18 years. This one right here is something that has helped out significantly. And so one of the things that it really helps out is muscle development and also strength. So muscle development, strength, but indirectly muscle development because it can help you to lift more weights, progressive overload becomes easier, consistency over time, helping you to build more muscle. But it also helps, again, more strength. It also helps up with cognition, uh, focus, uh, energy as well. And it's a key driver for energy in our body systems. So if you're a little bit depleted on creatine or the partitioning of creatine into muscle cells, into brain cells, helping neurons fire better as well. You're gonna have uh, more of an issue with things like focus, memory, uh, you might get more brain fog, you might get more fatigue, and this is something that shows up a lot with type one diabetics. But to really understand how creatine works, it's better for us to break this down visually. So when your body has energy, consider movement, moving around, lifting weights, walking, your body releases energy. And how your body releases energy is through a molecule called ATP. This stands for adenosine triphosphate. So one adenosine molecule, and then you've got your three phosphates that are attached to that adenosine molecule. Now, when you are contracting or lifting weights, your body will release a phosphate group off, and now you have ADP. So you went from ATP to ADP. That releases energy. When you have ATP, that is like a battery pack that where your body has a store of energy that can be used and released. 95% of creatine is usually held in the muscles. Then you've got about 5% that could be toward, more in the brain, for example, to give us energy there as well, help us to focus and to memory, cognition, think about energy. But even energy overall through skeletal muscle or brain tissue, your body needs creatine in order to help make the process smooth. So now we have ATP, we know that we release a phosphate group, gives us ADP, and that gives us energy. Now how creatine works in your mitochondria, consider your mitochondria these little organelles in your body's cells that are the powerhouse for energy. They help your body to create energy. Now, when your body has creatine, your body within the mitochondria, ATP plus creatine in the mitochondria, your body is going to convert Creatine to phosphocreatine because it's harder for ATP to just get out of the mitochondria. Now, in your mitochondria, this is where your body is going to, through what's called oxidative phosphorylation, 
take things like glucose from the carbohydrates you ate, uh, fats from the fats you ate in the form of ketones, and then you're also gonna have um, oxygen as part of this process. Now, think about walking on a treadmill. This is gonna use a lot of the energy powered through this mitochondria to create this ATP, which then can just be recycled and your body is using, again, glucose and those fatty acids and oxygen to continue to power your body's energy system create by creating this ATP, right? Now, in order through, when we think about anaerobic training, this is when you don't have as much, you don't have oxygen on board that cannot help to continue to create ATP. Your body is going to take ATP from the mitochondria and create what's called phosphocreatine. This phosphocreatine gets released from the mitochondria into your body's cytoplasm. That's the space between the organelles in your system. Now it ends up happening, this phosphocreatine, which is a phosphate group with creatine, it's going to carry this phosphate group out into your body's cytoplasm or sarcoplasm in muscle cells. Now what ends up happening now through muscle contractions, your body releases a phosphate group, that releases energy, and now you've got ADP. But you have to recycle this process, otherwise it's not gonna run as efficient to give you energy. And so where creatine comes in, creatine is now gonna come in, attach to this phosphate group, and now phos uh, the phosphate will be donated to ADP, our ADP over here, to then create ATP again, and the process can kind of recycle itself even in the cytoplasm or the sarcoplasm if we're talking about the spaces between organelles and muscle cells. Now, by doing this, it's like recharging a battery. Now you've got ATP that can then be used again for energy and the process repeats itself. So creatine helps to facilitate the conversion of ADP back to ATP more efficiently to give you more energy. This is how creatine works, and this is why supplementation can help to increase this process to make it run smoother by giving you more of a storage capacity of creatine. Now, what we have to understand in type 1 diabetics, and this is something that I've explained before with type 1 diabetics in terms of how our bodies are different. We take 100% of our insulin in our peripheral tissues, whereas a non-diabetic, you've got it coming, your insulin comes from your pancreas, goes directly through a portal vein to the liver and 30 to 40% gets released to muscle tissue and fat cells. Whereas we take 100% at muscle and fat cells. What this means is in a type one diabetic, what you might have because of a dysregulation of insulin, you could have the issue of having, what we're seeing is more creatine than usual is more in red blood cells than non-diabetics. This means that this is a result of that process where type one diabetics can have more insulin resistance at muscle cells, meaning it makes it harder for insulin to do what it has to do to drive even creatine into the body's muscle cells. This can become an issue because now that energy process is not running as smooth as it should because we have higher levels of uh, insulin in the peripheral tissues leading to more insulin resistance, harder to drive the creatine into the muscle cells. Also, in terms of breaks in between sets, the process of running that whole process of the phosphocreatine getting into the cytoplasm, the space in between the organelles, and then helping to recycle ADP to ATP to create energy. This process doesn't run as smooth because we can have what's a little bit of mitochondria dysfunction, meaning inside those powerhouse organelles, it's not running as efficiently as it should. So as a result, now the process is kind of lagged in terms of getting that phosphocreatine out, utilizing that phosphocreatine to then create more ATP in the body cells to power those anaerobic workouts. And this is where you're going to see most of the anaerobic scenario workouts that you are thinking about resistance training, think about high intensity sprinting. Your body is going to have more of a harder time with these processes because in our mitochondria, we can have a little bit more dysfunction. So now you've got a two tiered problem where the mitochondria isn't functioning as well as it should. And you have more of the partitioning of creatine, more in red blood cells than usual, rather than it being driven into muscle cells to help with this efficiency. So now we're seeing how type one diabetes can be slightly different with how we're utilizing creatine for energy. And it could be wise, a lot of type one diabetics sometimes experience fatigue or they're more tired throughout workouts or tired throughout the day or have more brain fog outside of controlling blood sugars. 
creatine and how we use it could be a major impactor of this. So as a type one diabetic, supplementing with creatine can help to make this process run a little bit more efficient by loading up the body a little bit more with more creatine that could help the system to function better, to make the processes in between sets run a little bit smoother so you get more creatine in between those sets to help to make those conversions, again, helping creatine to transfer a phosphate group back to ADP to give you more energy reserve to then go and do another set and keep that process going. So we're seeing the importance of loading up the body with more creatine to help that process run smoother. This is even more important when we consider vegan diets because if we know that creatine is already a little bit less efficient in a type one diabetic based on the body's mitochondria not being as efficient for the phosphocreatine getting into the body's uh, cytoplasm and sarcoplasm to help to convert ADP to ATP and create more energy. And because of the partitioning of that creatine, meaning that it's not as efficient, it tends to be more in red blood cells than it tends to be in the body's muscle cells due to potential uh, insulin resistance and how we administer our insulin. 100% coming from peripheral tissues for type one diabetics versus the 30 to 40% in a non-diabetic goes to peripheral tissues, the system is different. And as a result of the system being different on a fundamental level of insulin, it makes other things unbalanced. And so again, if you're a vegan as a type one diabetic, you might be running into a scenario now of having less creatine overall from a non-diabetic vegan, but that which helps out with more energy to get through workouts, to, to feel less brain fog of the day. But now you're on the vegan diet, which is even less uh, insulin overall. So we need to make sure that we're focused on getting even even a vegan especially getting creatine into their diet to help to make up and buffer that difference also there's two different creatines for us there's two different creatines for us to be mindful of as well you've got creatine hcl and creatine monohydrate creatine monohydrate is what's studied the most and that's the one that i'm taking that you guys saw earlier with the bottle that i had that creatine monohydrate you can do about five grams per day you can do a loading phase this loading phase would be 10 grams for about seven to ten days and then you go on five grams per day now the thing to be mindful of is that with the loading phase that you guys are going to do you guys might be in a position where you have some gastrointestinal issues some bloating you might be taking a little bit more shits than usual just because you're taking a lot of creatine at one time so i recommend just keeping that five grams and seeing how your body responds to it also important to note that on a creatine monohydrate, you're more likely to gain a little bit of weight. Now, this is just because creatine pulls water into your body's muscle cells. Intramuscular water increases. As a result, now you might gain a little bit more weight from having more of that water being pulled into your body cells. Now, with creatine HCL, that stands for creatine hydrochloride. So creatine attached to hydrochloride versus creatine monohydrate is creatine attached to a water molecule. So if we do creatine and hydrochloride, your body, uh, it makes things a little bit more efficient with getting into the cells. So you don't need as much as you would with a creatine monohydrate. And with that, you need about three grams per day or two and a half versus five grams per day with creatine monohydrate. So it's going to do the same thing in terms of improving strength and creatine absorption is already Creatine monohydrate absorption is already about 99%, so you're good there. But if you want to do something that might be a little bit better on the gastrointestinal tract, and if you want something that might not help you gain weight, and I say might because it still could, then the creatine HCL could be a better option to help to see what happens in your body. This is extremely important for type 1 diabetics because your doctor now might start running tests. It's important to note that with more creatine means that your body's gonna break down more creatinine. Creatinine is not toxic for the body, it's just a byproduct of creatine breakdown. And if it's a byproduct of creatine breakdown, that's gonna show up more on tests that your doctor might run and your doctor might associate with kidney issues. Now, it's also important to note is that more muscle you have, the more storage capacity you have for creatine. So this is why it's important for type one diabetics to build muscle because they can also create more of a reservoir for more creatine to be held to help them facilitate more energy overall right because we know creatine is important for energy and so the more muscle you focus on building through resistance training the more you can create more of a reservoir for creatine which you're already depleted in versus the non-diabetic so now you can house more of that creatine to help your body and so that's also important for the doctor because more muscle means that your body can hold more creatine naturally. So even if somebody was not on a creatine supplement, their body likely would hold more creatine naturally through their system, which might show up more on, on uh, test results. So if you start working out, but you're not taking creatine, maybe this is something to bring. You have to bring this up to your doctor. But now you're also building muscle and you're taking creatine. 
more creatinine is going to show up on the test. So it's important to make your doctor aware of this so they understand why they might be seeing those differences. Now, what's also important for us to note, uh, you know, outside of the fact that I've got a really cute cat, there's some misconceptions when it comes to creatine. Now, some type one diabetics, I'd say one out of 50 to 100 might notice their blood sugar levels going a little bit higher, which is interesting because tests will show you that creatine can help with the triggering of GLUT4 to transfer that more towards the body's cells to help to shuttle nutrients in and glucose in, making you actually a little bit more sensitive. But what we're finding sometimes with some type ones that might notice the blood sugar levels skyrocketing and going all over the place with taking a monohydrate supplement. So if that's the case, be mindful if you do notice that and maybe switch to an HCL or you might have to get rid of it altogether or change your ratios to adjust for the spikes that you are noticing. Now, this isn't common, but it can happen. So that's why I want to bring it up for type 1 diabetics to be aware of. Also, if you're somebody that has pre-existing kidney issues, creatine might not be for you either because we have to get the, the kidneys functioning a little bit better. So I would stay away from that. But if you're somebody that does not have, not have pre-existing kidney issues, then you're okay with taking creatine. They've even supplemented creatine up to 20 to 30 grams per day for a year and with people that are type 2 diabetics and no issues were noted on creatine causing issues in the kidneys. So this really is not something that's seen in study material. So with that being said, it's still important for you to manage your diabetes and your blood sugars because you could easily be putting a lot more pressure on the kidneys if you constantly have chronically high blood sugars, if things are not managed for type 1 diabetes. So we do want to manage that. But overall, creatine is a safe supplement at 5 grams per day is all you need. And you can continue to take that to help to buffer some of the depletion that you have naturally with creatine to potentially help you give more energy during your workouts and naturally throughout the day. So for me, creatine is a powerhouse supplement that we could take. Um, I take a micronized version. Now, there's really, you don't have to. It could just help to make the process a little smoother, smaller particles of creatine, which could make, you know, the supplementation of it a little bit smoother, uh, more efficiency, better on the gut, uh, things like that. So you can, and blending it up in, uh, you know, shakes, different details like that, but it's not absolutely necessary, but I go for a micronized version of creatine as a result. So I know we went deep on that, but I hope it helps you guys out. If you guys have any questions, please, uh, you know, drop them down below. Make sure I'll get to them. And if, you're, if it's your first time on the channel, make sure you guys smash the subscribe button. Uh, hit that bell notification as well. And we'll continue rolling these videos. I'll see you guys in the next video.